Okay, welcome everyone to our ITP webinar. It's so wonderful to have you. Thank you so, so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. My name is Missy. I am Marketing and Communications for Rare Diseases. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming through. Uh, my name is Namsa. I'm the patient coordinator for Rare Diseases. I'm the one person who always sends you guys messages, checking in. Everybody, you guys don't say anything to me, but I love you. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for just giving us this hour to be with us here uh, to go through your journeys. I love the fact that we have four of you here. So it's different journeys. So it's going to be a very, very interesting conversation. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> So, Claire, why don't we start with you um, and basically just take us through what you noticed um, with the first few symptoms that you experienced that made you seek a diagnosis. Okay, so I woke up the one morning, I was covered in blood blisters, like from head to toe, all over my face all over my chest, all the way down to my feet. And um, I was actively bleeding through my period, but very heavily. Um, so I felt something was wrong, immediately went to the hospital. And unfortunately, I was losing blood. And they said if I was there half an hour later, I would have actually bled out because oh it started goodness. the night before and I went the next day. Yeah. So oh, that was my so first funny. experience. Wow. Mm. That is... It's quite an introduction. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. Um, having low platelets can get scary very quickly. Yeah. No, I can imagine. Um, Mandy, would you like to go next? Oh, yes, of course. Hi. Um, I think in my case, it wasn't um, a diagnosis straight away. It was a series of um, just funny cravings. As a young person, I used to crave a lot of sand. Um, and then, um, well, when I went to the hospital, I was in case and then they told me that I had iron deficiency. So I would go for a series of tests and um, ITP was not diagnosed then. So, and then I moved to Joburg when I started my working life. And I think because I wasn't taking my tablets anymore and um, I wasn't really paying attention to my health. And then I started a series of uh, serious bruises and uh, heavy bleeds, um, like uh, Claire mentioned. And so, yeah, it was, I think it, it was around about 2006 when I was officially diagnosed. Wow. Wow. Okay. You see what I meant when I said, um, Oh, Nikita is here. Hi, Nikita. How are you? Thank you for joining us, Nikita. Hi, sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. No worries at all. How are you? I'm okay, thanks. How are you, ladies? Very well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We're just doing a quick introduction uh, and finding out how everybody uh, went about and getting a diagnosis. And I would jump to Caitlin. Okay, um, can you hear me? Okay, yes. So um, my my diagnosis was actually very different. I was actually diagnosed in 1990. And at that time, they actually did not even know um, that there was such a thing called ITP. I was nine months at the time and I had bruising all over and my mom was actually called in. They called a social worker in for her thinking that I was actually being abused because of oh the bruises goodness. all over my body. And then when the bloods came back, um, they immediately started me on chemo because they thought that I had leukemia. And it was only after about a year or so that they pick up that it was actually not leukemia. After treating me with chemo and mm -hmm. cancer uh, treatment, did they realize that it was actually ITP? Wow. So that's how we found out that I have ITP. Oh my goodness. That's crazy. I can't believe you had to go through chemo for a year. Yes. Um, and they actually, um, on my little clinic card that I have, um, they even overdosed me with uh, chemo. It was actually quite a, from the way my mom described it, she was like, they actually called all our family members in and said, look, um, you have to say your final goodbyes because I had oh, sw wow. swollen up and stuff from that chemo. Um, so a lot of my 
issues that I currently have now as an adult um, mm-hmm. actually are a result from that chemo that I had when I was oh. a baby. From your misdiagnosis? Yes. Oh, shucks. Oh. Well, I can just imagine your mother going through all of that. Yes, she was actually up and down, and she was a nurse herself. And you know, the fact that they yes. called in like social workers and they're like, "This child is being abused because of the bruises on my body." Yeah, um, that's also quite a, an, a traumatic experience to go through. Being accused of abusing your child—it's just, yeah, I just can't imagine that. Yeah. So with ITP, I mean, that's one of the main things. The moment you have a bruise, people automatically think you're being hit or you know you're being abused of some sort. Yeah, wow. Oh, wow. Um, Lou, uh, do you mind uh, telling us how your journey went about? You're on mute. mute. <laughs> You're still muted. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mute. There, there we go. <laughs> there we Sorry go. about that, guys. No um, worry. Okay. As a child, I had a lot of um cravings. I craved coffee. I craved, uh, but I never wanted to drink it. I always wanted to try coffee, you know, or sand. Oh, I would sometimes suck at my clothes. I had funny cravings, but then I eventually got diagnosed with anemia. So I grew up knowing that I'm anemic. Whenever I went to the doctors, um, I was told, no, you're not taking the right treatment and this and this and that. I also had hectic nosebleeds, but nobody ever bothered to say, let's check your platelets. It was only until I fell pregnant with my um, second born. 2013, the gynecologist then told Nofori, there's a bit of a drop in your platelets, but it's not uh, critical yet. Um, I think it was like 110. So he just made me aware of it that we keep an eye on it. But throughout the pregnancy, I didn't really worry because it was a, it was still okay until yeah. I gave birth. After I gave birth and it was a natural birth, I was bleeding hectically and bleeding to a point where I couldn't use um, sanitary pads anymore. I had, I, I took my son's um, pampers and put it down there. Oh my goodness. That got controlled at some point. And then the nose bleeds didn't stop. I remember one night I bled from like 12 o'clock midnight until 4 a.m. Oh non stop. My husband then said, no. Let, let's go to the ER. Luckily, the doctor that was there said, you know what? I'm not going to treat your symptom. Let me just do a blood test and check. I suspect something. And it was then when they realized my platelets were on zero. Goodness. Oh, wow. Oh, That wow. was 2014. Yeah. So you were undiagnosed for a, a significant amount of time? Uh, yes, throughout my whole childhood. Wow. Well, you see, this then brings us to why we're having this webinar today. Wow. Mm. Imagine all the moms that uh, have kids <laughs> going through the same thing and they don't know. They cannot pick up on the yeah. signs. They just mm. don't know the symptoms. They, they, it's like you're bleeding, mm. put ice on your head. And that's it. Yes. <laughs> you have that's no sleep, put ice on the head. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. What a journey. Um, <laughs> Nikita? Yeah. Hi, ladies. Hi. So my story, yeah, I got diagnosed in 2012. What happened was I actually had bronchitis and I was booked off work for, oh no, I actually wasn't booked off work, sorry. I was on study leave and I went to the office and my manager took one look at me and she said, no, you're not well, go to the doctor. And while I was there, I'd noticed a bruise under my foot, but it was the middle of winter and it was odd to have a bruise under your foot considering you're wearing boots. 
and he also took one look at me and he said I suspect something and took my blood and my platelets were sitting on 11. He told me not to go back to the doctor to go straight to um, the hospital. I mean not back to work to the hospital I went straight to the hospital by the time I arrived at the hospital my platelets were on nine. They also did every test leukemia AIDS everything I was my parents were away. I was young. I was 25. I had no idea what was going on. They testing for all these things. I had no support. The hospital wasn't giving me any answers. And eventually they tested and they said, no, it's RTP, had platelet transfusions. And yeah, they said, because it dropped so low and so quickly, it will never come back. And it's acute RTP, what they told me back then. Then I had my daughter in 2013 and it, they dropped again just after I had her. I had to stop breastfeeding because of the medication and the cortisone and everything. Um, and yeah, after that, I tried to find out more information, obviously on it, on why I have it. And I eventually went the natural route because I actually went for a SCIO test, which is where they read your brain signals and brain waves and it picks up all your past and current problems with you. And it wasn't bringing up anything about RTP, it was bringing up vaccination damage. And eventually we put two and two together and realized that I'd had a vaccination the year before being diagnosed with RTP. So now I just monitor it with my homeopath and we treat it naturally because the side effects from the medication, honestly, to me, is worse than the actual disease itself. Okay. And the illness. Like, mm. And you have to be on so many other medications to counteract the side effects of the cortisone and whatever they're pumping you with. That, yeah, and now, thank goodness, I've only been hospitalized twice for it. Um, and we've managed to treat every drop that I've had naturally with oh, a course of... Yeah, they just pump me full of magnesium and a whole bunch of natural stuff and it magically actually works. And we've managed to keep it under control that way. So that you is, feel like your your quality of life is is maintained with the treatment that you are have will have chosen for yourself? I have. Luckily it works for me. I don't know if it would work for everyone. Mm. But in my case, it has worked. And yeah, it, it was a horrible experience to try and, you know, here's a 25 year old, my parents were away, my brother was away with my, I had no family here and they testing you for AIDS and they testing you for leukemia. And yeah, it's, it's terrifying and pumping you full of stuff. There's needles everywhere. At one point, the nurses, they were giving me the, uh, giving me a platelet transfusion. And I said to them, you know, I can actually feel coming into my body and being pumped into my body and it's burning and it's sore and they said to me well either just shut up and take it or you're going to land up in ICU and have a drip in your foot because we're running out of veins oh my and goodness. like the way you get treated in there is like you just take it or because they don't know they you know they had no idea mm -hmm. what was wrong and I think that's the scariest part I think that's extremely traumatic it, it was, it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and to give up breastfeeding my eight month old for, you know, like what do you do? It's it's a scary situation to be stuck in for anyone. No, I can absolutely imagine, especially having an eight month old. I mean, you know, your focus wants to be on your baby. Yeah, and you're stuck in hospital, and they're just pumping you full of stuff, and then more drugs to to counteract the side effects of the drugs and. You're literally like a walking zombie. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty much how it is. And yeah, I take my hats off to you ladies that have been stuck with it for years and had to go through it so many times. Like for me, the two times being in hospital was, it was traumatic enough. Oh, I can imagine. Being a 25 year old, being told you have ITP, you don't even know what it is. You've never no. heard of it. <laughs> the confusion that comes with it. I can honestly imagine it's yeah so and Mandy how about you in terms of your treatment um you know how has that 
affected your quality of life? Um, do you feel like you manage your symptoms? Uh, well, I try. I, I try. And uh, I've just told myself that um, ITP is, is part of my course. So it's something that I, I constantly study about. And I learn mostly from people's experiences and um, the, the research outcomes. But how um, I manage, um, because in my case, um, my, um, my immune system must always be uh, suppressed. So um, I don't know how I do it, but I have to strike a balance. I must not be, um, I cannot take boosters and uh, well, my system cannot be, my immune cannot be that low. So uh, medically I am taking uh, azapress. Uh, azapress, uh, they also call it azapotride, I think. Uh, it's an immune suppressant. And um, it didn't uh, respond instantly. It took maybe like six months for it to work. But before then I was on steroids. And um, uh, honestly, the side effects are bad. And and I think um, Nesquita was just talking about the side effects. They are very bad, guys. And one of the challenges that I struggle with is brain fog. You know, it, it takes a lot of effort for me to actually collect um, the, 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 the occurrences of of the previous day and you know when when I have to study for an exam I have to really maybe get um, supplements because the brain easily forgets and and I think most of us um, as the ITP warriors we have that issue and and part of it I'm also um, I have a dietitian that is helping me through the journey because I um, I realized that uh, the way that I eat, um, partly it had to do with me um, getting uh, my platelets in disorder because I don't think I was born with it because like, um, Lou was saying uh, those craving for sand. It started when I was a teen. I think I was in started five um, at that time, you know. So I think eating healthy for me is helping and, and taking my medicines, yeah. Yes. Wow. Amazing. Very interesting. But you and Lou had symptoms of cravings and Caitlin and Nikita, no, Nikita, um, misdiagnosed of leukemia, is it? You're Caitlin. Okay. Caitlin, leukemia. Yeah. yeah, yeah, leukemia. It's very interesting. Mm. Okay, I saw you nodding a lot to Nikita's experience. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm assuming you had the yeah. same trauma. Um, well, I was diagnosed as a child as well. Um, I was 15. I wasn't that young, but child welfare was called in and, um, for family abuse, they thought I was being abused at home. Um, they wanted to do house checks. Unfortunately, the hospital wasn't very aware of my condition, um, at that time. So that was 14 years ago that I was first diagnosed. Um, and the social worker took me out of the hospital while I was actively bleeding. So they were putting blood back into me um, while I was in hospital. And he insisted that I leave the hospital and made the doctors take my drips out and took me out of the hospital. And I ended up uh, bleeding out in the back of the car to the point where I actually passed out on the way to my house because I was bleeding out so heavily. And they had to, luckily I had somebody with me, a friend that was coming with me home, you know, as like a uh, support, um, cause I was so young, they made them turn around and take me back to the hospital. And I was actually, part, I was passed out for several hours. So yeah, it's very scary um, when the doctors don't know what's happening with RTP, they really don't understand how severe it can get very quickly. Um, and also, the child abuse thing, I'm a mother myself and bringing awareness is so important because I can't imagine other children and parents of children that are going through this, you know, they can't understand it. If my children are covered in bruises, their platelets are way above 400, of course I've checked and, you know, but the, the, it is something that we need to be aware of as parents, you know, there is actually an illness out there if your child has a bit too many bruises and they bump their head they could actually like very severely bleed you know 
So yeah, bringing awareness for children is very important, but it can get very extreme as well with child welfare. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, traumatic oh, all around, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's bad. It's honestly bad. I can just imagine being accused of abusing my son. <laughs> Oh yeah, no. <laughs> it's it's honestly bad. It's really bad. Um Lou, you, you mentioned that when you had your mm -hmm. diagnosis, your doctor was like, I suspect something. I think also Mandy, um, oh Nikita said the same thing that the doctor was straight on said, I suspect something. We need to test for something mm. else. What were your thoughts at that point? What were your feelings? And after you got the diagnosis, did you somehow have mixed feelings what what were you thinking did you ask questions did you have a conversation with the doctor honestly when she said to me just relax and sit but don't lie down just sit up straight and wait i i was a bit worried but i was also relieved that somebody's going to investigate this because some hospitals they would take me put me in a bath filled with ice and stuff to cool me down for the bleeding to stop but now this time I was like thank god there's somebody who wants to run tests and check what is actually happening so for me um that was a that was a great relief having to deal with the diagnosis though was a bit because the, the physician that I was um assigned to at that time didn't really know much, but he did research the illness. He did his research. He came back to me, but he was scared and he made me scared too. Like, if you fall down, you're going to die. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, it was scary, but I've always known something was wrong because of the joint aches and other things. So I was relieved that I got a diagnosis finally. The treatment I didn't like. At first I thought, yay, treatment's going to help me until I had to deal with the after effects because they pumped me with a lot of steroids. Um, you know, before I got IVIG, the only thing I got here in Rustenburg was steroids upon, until I actually cut ties with my physician. I said, you know what? I'm okay. <laughs> I'm going to go find help in Joburg and Going to Joburg is where I started IVIG. And that is the only treatment that actually works. So when I'm at home, I do use uh, stuff like natural stuff. I make, I blend fruits together. I eat a lot of greens. I boost my system through that. Then I would feel the difference in that. So, but when I do get a complete drop and it happens like once every five years, I go to hospital, get an IVIG, get it for like three days, then I'm good to go. Oh, okay. So um, yes. out of everyone um, uh, sharing that journey, I've picked up that uh, diet plays a lot of a role in, in, in with ITP. So you guys need to be on yeah. very healthy Not just diet, diet, but your mental health as well. You know, staying mm. in a positive yeah. outlook it can actually, I've been in a place where my partners are dipping and I will, my family will come together and I'll be in such a positive space that my platelets actually raise and, you know, they mellow out, you know, diets, mental health, all of those things and having support in ladies like these mm -hmm. that are going through the same thing. It's so powerful. Like I, you can't, I can't describe how powerful it is having the support of others <laughs> on the same journey. It makes yeah. us so happy to hear that. And I mean, like, what was everyone's first thought of knowing that there's somebody else with ITP? Because if I was to get my diagnosis of ITP, I'd be like, oh my goodness, am I the only person? And when somebody else, imagine Missy saying, I have the same. I'd be like, no, that's mine. It's me, I'm the <laughs> only one. So <laughs> how did it feel knowing that, okay, I'm not well, alone. We, spoke a, we used to speak a lot on that group. Like that group was always going constantly. Mm. We quiet and done because I guess we now know each other's stories a little bit more. We know who we are, but yo, we used to, we really lent on each other um, and we still do for those important moments. But I think in the beginning and also when new people join the group, um, 
you know, it's very important to engage and let them actually get all of that off of their chest because nobody in your life actually understands, you know, your mm. husband, your mm. best friend, nobody understands. They cannot, and you don't want them to understand, no. you know, it's amazing that we, that we have all found each other, you know, it's a blessing. So yeah. special. Um, so Caitlin, if you are comfortable to share, how would you explain your condition to your friends and family? Um, so we have actually, I've had that discussion um, a lot. Um, I, I have told them in just, so with me, there was no treatment back when I was diagnosed. Um, it was one option. You either had steroids and there was a point where I was in primary school and I was taking 28 steroids a day, you know, um, and then at seven, they said to me, by age seven, you have to have your spleen out. So there was no option whatsoever other than having your spleen out. So at seven, I had my spleen out and to explain it to your friends in primary school that, okay, now I can't play with you guys and I can't because my I have no immune system. Um, if I'm hanging around with children with, you know, kids in school, the germs and everything, I can't do the things they're oh, doing. It was very difficult to explain it. And then you do get um, the family members that, oh, now that you haven't had, because with ITP, you don't get cured, you relapse. So um, if after a couple of years and you haven't had a, a drop, oh, you cured of ITP. And I'm like, no, there is no cure. You know, you can relapse at any point. So it's it's very difficult to try mm -hmm. and explain it to your friends and family, unless that's why the group is, is, is actually such a good blessing in our lives because they sort of understand those struggles because you can explain mm -hmm. it so you can say look and then people will compare it to hemophilia and they'll compare it to leukemia mm -hmm. and okay. it's actually walls it walls apart it's not the same it's it's completely different um so i i don't think there's actually a way for me to explain it. i still struggle today um and i've had it all my life to explain it to friends and family oh my goodness and as a child obviously the understanding is completely different than as an adult. When you were put on steroids at such a young age, how did your, your doctor explain that to you why you had to be taking this medication? Um, it wasn't really explained much by my doctor. So um, like I said to you, there was I was diagnosed at a point where they I don't even think we had any ITP cases in South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. It was just me and I remember there was another patient who used to come in actually on the same day um, and he had hemophilia and we would get treated the same um, for hemophilia and the doctor would just be like you know it was my mom who actually tried to explain it that look this is the situation you can't you know the best she could because there was no understanding of the issue of ITP. ITP wasn't a thing. It was hemophilia. And then they actually described it as the female version of hemophilia. So that's what it was actually referred to back when I was diagnosed, the female version of hemophilia. So, you know, it was it was only when I got older and, you know, you actually start to do your own research. And then I met uh, Chantal, who most of you may know. Um, and then we started comparing notes on the group and we're like, OK, you know, and it's actually most of my my journey. I've actually only really started to like, oh, so that's why they did this to me. Oh, so that when I hear the other group members actually talking, like, oh, OK, I remember like um, someone just mentioned the 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 ice bath and I remember there was a period where I was also put on an ice bath but nobody explained why you know they put mm -hmm. me on an ice bath so there was no explanation as as such for me when I was diagnosed oh wow goodness. wow oh, wow it's it's it was hectic for mm -hmm. a, a young girl it was extremely hectic so Mandy um quick one um same as Caitlin when you got um, diagnosed and you had a conversation with the doctor regarding treatment, like what, what, what were your thoughts on that? And was it explained properly on what's going to happen, what the after effects are going to be, what to expect? Yeah, like the brain fog yeah. and what the to expect? Effects. Yeah. Um, I think I, at first I was treated by a physician and shame man, the poor guy didn't know much. 
um, whenever I come to him, he would open his book and he says, okay, Mandy, uh, now we must remove the spleen. And then constantly I would ask him, what if the spleen doesn't work? I think that also encouraged me to find out for myself. And um, I'm a Christian, so uh, we would have prayer groups and I would tell them about my problem. And I think at some point I was thinking that maybe uh, something is beating me because I have these bruises. Maybe there's a ghost <laughs> that keeps on beating me at night. And uh, but fortunately enough, at church there was this lady uh, who is a nurse and she said to me, you know what, uh, you should seek a second opinion. And I think then she tried to find for me uh, what of the best specialist um, in, um, uh, I think it was Donald Gordon, so that's where I went. Uh, unfortunately, the diagnosis was done by my physician who didn't know much. So it was a very traumatic thing for me to know I have ITP and he would say to me, I must be admitted and the nurses must take care of me. They must take me to the toilet. They must make sure that I don't fall. They must bath me. And they were very irritated with me because there's this patient that they had who uh, they had to be extra careful around. But then the long and the short of it, I, I left uh, my lovely doctor and I went to the uh, a hematologist um, in, so no, no, he's an oncologist. So he's the guy that is treating me now. He's very informed uh, because Donald Gordon, I think they specializes more on the, on the cancerous uh, diseases. So um, to be honest, when the news were broken to me, I was confused. I was scared, um, you know, um, to be told that you can bruise to, you can bleed to death. You know, that's very scary. And it's something, you know, with our black community, uh, we are very secretive and it's not something that you can just share with anyone. And I agree with, um, with the ladies when they say, I mean, finding a group was a blessing because we, 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 we are, are connected with people who, um, experience the same and you know with ITP we are always tired and people will view that as someone who's lazy um, you know as someone who's maybe seeking attention and you know I was just a, a nodding with Claire when she said um, a, a, a mental uh, health is also important because um, if you just feel slightly down or depressed you will see bruises in your body so that's itp guys but yeah it's okay we have a bigger group of women supporting each other <laughs> i love i love 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 so much having you mentioned that our black community is not really well educated and very judgy when it comes to that lou mentioned that she she went into her periods for a very, very long time where pets were not working at that point. So Lua, I can imagine you explaining to your family that this is what I have. And the first thing they think is you are bewitched, isn't it? Of course, of yeah. course. And, you know, I would, I remember I would tell some of the elders in my church, uh, you know, um, at the end of the service, we have a, a session where they will pray for you. And when you explain this, you could see that the prayer is among, you know, some spirit that is attacking this person. But I don't blame them because they didn't know. Um, luckily, yeah. we had a nurse and, and she knew uh, so much about this disease. So she said to me, you know what I'm going to find you someone so that's when I started to see change and an improvement in my health yeah wow wow you were so lucky to have had the opportunity to have people and to have somebody that was willing to educate and now you are the one who's educating now how nice is it so Claire um being a mother right did you question studying treatment to the question, what's going to happen to my child? Is this inherited? What what happens when I get pregnant? Did you have those yeah. questions to your doctor? And yeah, definitely. They... So um, I was diagnosed when I was 15 and I went into, uh, was in hospital for six weeks and I had IVIG and steroids and I went into remission for eight years. So for the rest of my teenage and early adulthood, it wasn't something I really thought of, but it was something I was aware of, obviously, going through such a scary experience, it's always there. Then a year after, a year and 10 days after I had my first child, um, I noticed the spotting, bruising, and I knew exactly what it was. 
I went for a blood test and my platelets were at zero. And I had just moved away from my hometown, away from my mom, you know, and everything. Um, just moved, just started a new job. Oh, you guys have low chilling. <laughs> <laughs> so when we don't um, move, then that's the lights go off. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just started a new job and I had a one-year-old and it was very scary. I also had, I continued breastfeeding for a while while on steroids. Um, but I noticed him picking up a little bit of weight because steroids make you retain fluid. So I noticed that in him and I actually stopped breastfeeding because of that. Um, and then when he was coming, so from that point up until today, which is nearly six years, um, my platelets have been low the whole time. And I have two boys and trying to get them not to play rough with mom is impossible. It was, and when they were like two years old and two and four, because there's a two year age gap, it was so hard for me to try and explain to them that no, you can't jump off the couch onto mommy's tummy. That's like a little bit dangerous. Um, but yeah, I think through all the times that my platelets have dropped and I've been in hospital, um, they definitely understand that mom is different. You know, that's what I say to them. I just say mom's a little bit different. Um, that you just got to be softer around me. And I, I used to, I'm doing a lot better now than I have been, but I used to get fatigue where I literally couldn't get out of bed for days. And having two little boys watching you go through that is so traumatizing for them. Watching, like they watch you go into hospital while we were going through COVID times, I wasn't allowed to see them. Um, and I would see them through the window. We would sneak them close to my window so I could see them. And yeah, they're so young. It's hard for them to, I can't explain to them exactly what is going on because they can't comprehend it. It's just mom's a little bit different and they've gotten used to it. And now that I'm doing so much better, they notice it and they're taking full advantage of like the fatigue being gone and all of that because they haven't been on medication since February, I decided to stop medication. I was like, I can't do this anymore. And yeah, I'm back to, I'm feeling very healthy and my kids are benefiting, yeah. yeah. Love so it for you. <laughs> so Nikita, what words of wisdom would you share with someone who is newly diagnosed? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> stay away from the steroids. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no, honestly, there are other treatments out there. Um, speak to people, speak to find a support group like we have, speak to other people, patients with RTP, try alternative routes. I mean, my doctor, when I said to him, I'm going to try a natural route actually cut me off, um, my GP that had diagnosed me to start off with. So, yeah, and it's, yeah, I actually, I, I don't know what to really say, but yeah, just don't go for the first thing they tell you to you. Read yeah. up about mm. it. Do your own research. Do your own research. So unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, you do trust the medical professions, a lot of the times we do, that's our go-to, but sometimes they don't always know what's best for us. Is I suppose Yeah, and mine. I think, especially individually, it sounds like different treatments work for different people. It's not <laughs> one size fits all. Yeah. Um, and I have to commend all you ladies because it seems like you've all put in your own research, you questioned you know, what you told. And I think that's so empowering and that's so amazing. And it's a great message to send to other people who are in your position who don't quite understand what they're dealing with to research and ask their own questions and, you know, not be afraid to go against what your medical professional is yeah. advising. Well, not go against it, but just ask. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes, and you mm -hmm. can't learn better from anybody that, than other patients, you know, like the support that 100%. we have. I think we've learned most of about this disease from each other, you know, going on this journey together. Yeah. No, I think it's mm. so wonderful that you have each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you guys have created your own family in that group. I popped in. <laughs> I saw somebody posted um, a photo of their leg 
but that it was because we were cat. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes my cat decided to take it my was you. <laughs> I had to post it in another group and said, only you guys would understand. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's a scratch, but then all of around it, you can just see the orange starting. Yeah. And like a normal person would scratch by a cat and it's okay. Where <laughs> mine starts wearing purple like immediately. It's just... Oh. Exactly. It screams abuse. I'm telling you, it screams <laughs> abuse. <laughs> My husband, when I met him, it was, yeah, it was quite funny because then I would say to him, like, I feel like my platelets are low. And he would walk up to me and he would just just touch me on my arm. And we knew if a bruise okay. came, then then it's time to go to the hospital or time to get checked because, yeah, literally just touching your skin comes up in a bruise. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So, Caitlin, um, having been diagnosed when you were a baby, what 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 did your mother go through with all of that? What as a caregiver to trying to be strong for you and for herself, having to explain to family members that my child has this and nobody understands because even the doctor did not understand. What what did she go through and what support was there for her? So um, we actually lost my my dad at around when I was about two, so. Um, mm-hmm the journey for her was, it was actually just her and I for many years. Um, so she was actually a nurse at the time and she had to give up her job because she had to become a full-time parent to me, obviously, because um, out of a month, I'd be three weeks in the hospital, one week at home. Um, so you really can't, you know, she had to be with me full-time. She, uh, we learned to just, I mean, anybody who knows my mom and I we were very close because the support that she gave me and she understood I think um I, I'm I'm just laughing at like our relationships and stuff I remember when I was getting married she said her words of you know wisdom to my husband was like all I'm saying is just be careful you don't want to get arrested don't touch her too hard <laughs> she <used laughs> it to because you know it's uh, she would understand that you know this is the journey this is this is what happens, you know, um, the moment I'd say, you know, I'm not feeling well, I'm feeling lightheaded, she would take it seriously, because she would understand, whereas if you tell somebody else, they think, oh, you know, she's sick again, or, you know, she looks fine, and that's the thing with ITP, you look fine, but you're not fine, or internally, there's a lot happening, and so support-wise, I think it was just her and myself that we just had to, you know, come together and just try and find some sort of support between the two of us because she understood me and I mean we had late nights and early mornings and you know all these trips to the doctor and the hospital and stuff so I think we were both just leaning on each other throughout the journey oh wow imagine wow uh goosebumps that you guys are together all the way all the way I'm going to echo you there if they don't see it they don't think it exists um, that's what I always say. If people don't see it, they don't think it it exists. So it's all in your head. You'll be told to go pray about it. It's I know, I know, I know. Wow, you guys are so. Your stories are so inspiring. Uh, wow, wow, and how you guys have just carried yourself through all of that. And have have has anyone um been on remission and then relapsed? Oh, Clay, you did mention that you went through yes, eight yeah. years, hey? Eight so you kind of like had your your teenage years. You like um uh, yeah, I had my heart. <laughs> it calmed me down, but I'm doing I'm doing good at the moment. Um, but obviously my RTP has become secondary. Um, to I have myelofibrosis, um, which is a type of leukemia. So um, that they discovered that last year and it made my white blood cells, red blood cells, all of my cells go low because now I have a bone marrow uh, complication basically. Um, So yeah, (laughs) sorry, I got a little bit sidetracked there. But yeah, um, my, yeah, my ITP has become secondary. um, So now it's not ITP anymore. So even though I had that relapse, if it was RTP six years ago, or if it was just a symptom of this, and I've had it for this whole time, 
we don't really know. Um, but yeah, it's a journey. That's the thing. It can, ITP can just be a symptom. And you have all these other things coming at you and you think it's side effects from the medication. And then years down the line, suddenly you realize, oh, but actually this whole other thing was going on the whole time. It wasn't just the ITP. Um, that's where I'm at at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So after my splenectomy, I actually relapsed about two years later. And I was fine after that. And then when I had my daughter, I relapsed after that as well. Um, actually, the day of my C-section, I relapsed. Um, I was fine throughout my whole pregnancy. And the day of my C-section, my platelets dropped to 20. Um, then I relapsed uh, 11 days after I had her. And then I think about eight years ago, I relapsed again. So I've been fine since, since then. I'm not on any medication at the present moment. It's just obviously the diet and the lifestyle that you just keep monitoring. Okay. Right. Your, your ITP, Caitlin, doesn't have timing. Just as you have a baby, when you need to take care <laughs> the baby, it says, look at Hi. me, I'm back. <laughs> it, it was the worst because I was scheduled... I was actually scheduled for like uh, for a C-section around 12 and then they came to me and they said to me, well, sorry, you can't have your C-section today. We've got to give you platelets. Your platelets have dropped. And then I had to go under general anesthetic um, to, in order to have my daughter. Oh, I'm so sorry. It wasn't the experience. I'm sure that you. Yeah, it was. It <laughs> really wasn't. Yeah. I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. Just to add on what uh, Kat is saying, um, I'm, I'm just uh, reflecting uh, about it. Um, also, when I was having my boys, I had a, a child in 2010 and I had another child in 2011. And in both those instances, um, my platelets were very low. I remember when I was pregnant with the second one, uh, the platelets were like one and um, because I couldn't believe that I, I was pregnant so I actually did a blood test and I remember the ladies at Lancet said no with such low platelets um, the Lord doesn't permit us to to let you go you have to promise us that um, you will actually call your doctor and you know because I had abscond medication my doctor was so angry with me um, he said why are you not taking tablets and at that time I was still taking uh, prednisones and you know with prednisones um, you can't we really can't take them for that long so I just stopped taking them but yeah when when the babies comes and and, and a person is pregnant uh, it really takes a lot of strain so I think our immune takes a lot of strain from that yeah I'm just yeah. um, adding to what Kate was saying there yeah, I, I can add to that. Um, so m my first relapse was my son was a year old. And then when I had my second child, it, he sent me into a miracle remission throughout my whole pregnancy until a few weeks after he was born, I dropped straight down to zero. I'm back. Medication. Yeah, it's back. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. Wow. So um, just in closing, this is something that um, I'd like everyone, oh, well, I'm going to go around the circle again. I just want to know um, where you think additional support could be offered to patients. So uh, Lou, should we start with you? <laughs> I think <laughs> additional support would be educating our families. Okay. I think that would really help if our families can get more information about the disease as to because stress is another thing that really just brings disaster to somebody with ITP. You can't go too high or too low in terms of your emotional well-being. So if our families can get educated, how to handle, how to support us, you know, how to just be there for yeah. us. So if they can get a complete understanding of what ITP is, then that would really help. Oh, of course, I can imagine. Okay, Nikita? Yeah, I would also like that the doctors also can explain a little bit more. Like, yeah, when I was diagnosed, it was pretty much, oh, it's ITP, it stands for back then, 
um, idiopathic thrombosepsisemia, purpurma, whatever. And he mm -hmm. said that idiopathic means we don't know. It's a medical mystery and that's all we yeah. know. And that's what I was told. And I was like, well, that that's great. Um, that's terrifying. <laughs> and yeah, it, mm. like, like the lady said, it, everyone has agreed. We've all had to go out and find out more about it on our own because yes. nobody could tell us anything. And I don't think I'm the only patient that's had that problem. I think all the ladies at some point have been there. I mean, I think I've been to see four hematologists. The one lady said to me, oh, no, your case isn't important because you only drop every three, four years. Um, I've got people whose platelets are on zero and that's more important. And yeah, you don't need to worry. And I've been, I've been told the most ridiculous things. It's, yeah, it's pretty much finding out for yourself. Yeah. That's so disheartening. Mm -hmm. You you, you want to be heard. That's I suppose it's not really heard. It's just like I want to know more. And unfortunately, there isn't more to be known at this point, or there wasn't back then. Um mm -hmm. 10 years ago. It was just a well, we don't know, so sorry. Um, yeah. kind of situation. So yeah, to anyone going forward these days, getting diagnosed in nowadays, I think it's a little bit easier. There is more information out there. Um, but still, just to be informed about exactly what is going on. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah it's, it's not um, any information, I suppose. Important. It's great information. Yeah. And Kate, what are your thoughts on that? What do you think um, I, should be done? I also agree. I think it's also with the GPs. I mean, uh, I'm currently residing in, in Johannesburg and I mean in order to get an appointment with a hematologist you wait months um, you wait mm. a very really long time in order to and then you've still got to go through the process of you know why you need to be there and if you go to a GP and you say okay this is what I have um, they don't take you seriously they don't oh it's just your imagination and they'll ask you oh do you think your symptoms are making you anxious or you're anxious because of you know, mm -hmm. something. So it's immediately you have anxiety, you have mm -hmm. some sort of, you know, um, they don't take you seriously when you know your body, you know what's happening, what's about to happen, you want to catch it before it gets to that uh, decline. And they'll say to you, no, um, do you think it's your symptoms that are making you anxious or you're anxious because of something else? So, you know, I definitely think more education with regards to our GPs because that's normally the first stop that we, we go to, um, your GP. And if the GPs are more educated on it, then it sort of gives us, you know, a better standing in order to get the proper treatment there. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I fully agree. And Mens, uh, since all you do, uh, all of you ladies, I would commend you for just self-advocating and you do your own research. And Mendy, when you have information, do you... When you get the opportunity to share information, say with your doctor or your GP, we'll just tell you that it's in your head. Do you have do you allow yourself to educate and explain what, what this is? Do you do you do that? Or you like do your own research? Um I I I think uh when when I uh, met uh, my dietitian, she was so impressed. Uh, because I think I was one of the first client with such a disease. So with her knowledge combined with mine, because I know what works for me and I know how I feel. If she recommends something, I can more or less tell, oh no, that one won't work or oh, this will work. I mean, you know, something very sensitive uh, with regard to the vaccine, you know, when we, we spoke about it and she said to me, um, you know what, um, with ITP, um, uh, uh, most uh, uh, people they treat they are treated based on research so with regards to COVID COVID is new and there's no research with regards to COVID vaccine and ITP so she said to me you know at the end of the day these are the facts and you have to make a decision so because I went out there and 
when I got to my oncologist, I already had my guns. You know, she, he said what he said, and I said what I said because uh, um, I, I was, I was uh, um, educating myself about it. And definitely I do. I think I become a nuisance sometimes with my colleagues at work because I seem to be clued up in mm -hmm. some of the illnesses because of ITP, you know, um, and, you know, I, 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 feel very concerned when I see someone taking um, a slimming mixture, uh, someone starving themselves, because uh, I, I can almost tell that at certain stage in their lives, ITP might strike in, you know, um, the young people um, who want to keep slim and slender, you know, somewhere, somehow, uh, it will come back either as anemia, either a, a, as, as ITP. I mean, I think ITP is the extreme so um, what you guys are doing is really great, but there is definitely, definitely still more people oh, that you so want to reach. Yeah. So, yeah. Especially our, our community in Nomsa. I mean, Yo. you know, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a taboo <laughs> with the IDP. You know, you're coming with this fancy uh, word, you know, but it, it is there. It is there. Yeah, we... Slowly, slowly, slowly and surely, I promise you, we'll, it's a battle we're going to win. It's honestly a battle we're going to win. We, we, we had a conversation with Missy the other day about blood donation and our community. And wow, slowly, slowly, we're getting there. We're getting there. Sure. And Claire, anything that you, um, or any areas that you feel needs more support, uh, where do you feel? So I guess doctors, nurses, everybody being more aware of our mental health, um, that this is very intense news to hear about, you know, we have to find new, a completely new way of living life after we get a diagnosis like this, everything changes for us, uh, diets, our activities, everything changes, so people around us, doctors, anybody just being more aware of our mental health and how we're feeling and also taking into consideration that steroids actually make you go a little bit loopy sometimes <laughs> you know steroids are a thing they make you yes. go crazy yes. and not being given that space by even just by doctors not realizing that you might be a little bit more tearful over the next couple of days while you're locked in this hospital getting pumped full of medication um mm. yeah I would, that would be my thing just people being more aware of our emotions with people it's hard yeah I think often when you're diagnosed initially people always think of the physical side effects mm. Um, mm -hmm. and the emotional side effects are kind of forgotten about but you raise yeah. a very good point that it's actually equally if not more important because you need your mind to be strong yeah definitely yeah yeah okay well we've gone through all the questions that we had um throughout the session so there are um, no additional questions so with that, I just want to say thank you so, so, so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for thank sharing. Thank you for story. giving us the platform. Of course, yeah. of course. Um, it's been so wonderful to chat to you ladies. We appreciate it and we appreciate your time. Um, we're extremely grateful and thank you for your contribution. Um, and thank you for everyone who joined and watched and yeah, contributed okay. to a, a great webinar. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are just yeah you rock say eh? i would say womandla in zulu do you guys should know what womandla mean? mean womandla like it's woman yeah with mandla on the side but mandla is like strong, oh, strong woman. womandla <laughs> <laughs> thank you so very yeah, much hey. uh what an insightful conversation um thank you we've learned a lot a lot the education is amazing Thank you Thanks so much, so, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.